Good morning, everyone, uh, to, uh, <laughs> uh, to the very first session uh, on day two. It's a rather early session, particularly for those who perhaps have watched the penalty shootout between Argentina and, uh, Ar and Holland, as I have, which, which ended at 2 a.m. But nonetheless, it, it, it's great to be here. And, and uh, all joke aside, obviously, this is uh, one of the most pertinent, most timely sessions of this year's World Policy Forum. It is titled The Future of the EU and European Security After the Ukraine War. I wish we could sit here today and speak about the state of the world after the Ukraine war. Unfortunately, we are not quite there. No. But I couldn't have asked for a better panel, more esteemed speakers, uh, to be diving into this very uh, timely and important subject matter in alphabetical order. To my immediate left, he is a member of the German Bundestag and the coordinator of transatlantic cooperation of the German government. Please welcome Peter Breyer. Okay, good morning. Peter, good to have you with us. We'll, 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 I, I will revert to you in just a moment. We have with us the former president of Mongolia. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome this morning President Elbek Dorsch. He is a very good friend of the World Policy uh, Conference, been here many times. He's a senator in the Polish parliament and the chairman of the Foreign and EU Affairs Committee in the Polish Senate. Good morning to Bogdan Klitsch. Hello. Delighted to have with us the personal advisor to the high representative and vice president of the commission of the EEAS. Great to have him with us, Zaki Laidi. Eden. And last but certainly not least, he is the founder of the Hubert Bedrin Council and, of course, the former Minister of Foreign Affairs of France. Delighted to see him here. Hubert Bedrin, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> Peter, let, let's dive right in here. Um, th this conflict which started, this war which started in February 24th has been a strain on the entire world, certainly on Europe, and of course, its most populous, most affluent member, Germany, uh, particularly with a new government in place uh, since December, uh, which was confronted with this war right away. Um, Germany has been somewhat criticized uh, in Europe, but also beyond, for not doing enough, for not stepping up to the plate, for not sending the necessary equipment uh, that Ukraine needs. Give us a sense from Berlin, the view from Berlin at this particular moment. Thank you very much. Uh, delighted to be here also with this uh, exceptional panel. So to your question, um, yes, uh, now, uh, by the way, I'm now in the opposition because we lost, um, <laughs> so I'm not the transatlantic coordinator anymore. That was a government position that I enjoyed to have for four years. <coughs> but um, yeah, we are, we are like 10 months into this war. And the German government certainly, like many others, never expected anything to happen like that, to have a on-the-ground, like, conventional war in Europe. So nobody was really prepared. Although, I have to admit, uh, there was enough or sufficient intelligence months before that nobody really should have been surprised by the time of uh, February 24th that actually Russia invaded Ukraine. There was a lot of material, satellite and everything, pictures that we, that we had intelligence briefings on. So actually it's something like, well, surprise, surprise, uh, something. We woke up to a war by the end of uh, February this year. I don't buy that. But, you know, with the new German government just having come into office, uh, just, just like two, three months after that, of course it took them like completely uh, unprepared. And, um, I think everybody needs to understand that apart from like political party issues that that you know um, I, As I said, I'm on the position now. I'm not part of that government anymore uh, We fully have to understand that for Germany. It was a completely uh, Confrontation with everything with their core principles because we had we had to you know to make a decision to turn 180 degrees around with regard to deliver weapons at all be it normal weapons 
or heavy weaponry, all the way up to battle tanks, which we have not yet delivered, by the way, which I criticize my government of not doing enough in, in, indeed. But we had, not, we had one of the core principles was not to deliver any kind of weapons into any conflict or even war zone. And with regard to our history in Ukraine, of the, in the Second World War, we, the, the, the German Wehrmacht back then, the, the army killed millions of Ukrainians. Yes, there, it was difficult for us to first, like, to be the first ones to deliver weapons, so, um, you know, in Ukraine, to Ukraine. But um, I don't buy that, you know, we're still lacking behind. Half a, month, half a year ago, six months ago, we should have made quick and the right political decisions, like deliver, delivering heavy weaponry, deliver airspace defense, which we now did. But there's always this narrative that I keep hearing, uh, and which actually my American friends were confronting me, me with earlier this week. I spent uh, three days earlier this week in, in Washington, D.C., and the administration, but also my, my friends on the Hill, on both sides of U.S. Congress, who were in session just a month after the midterm elections, were asking me questions, do we have a German problem? Um, they appreciate that we are delivering now, but um, this narrative that, well, if we deliver the Leopard 2, which they desperately want, and I think they need the Ukrainians, where well, it takes a lot of training, maintenance, and all that, and ammunition, yes, that, that's exactly why we should have decided to deliver that um, uh, half a year ago, because we know it takes a lot of time. It's not easy. We, 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 have, that, that we, we have enough of these, ta of these battle tanks, which would could make a difference in that war. And uh, let me finish now. Uh, never, we should never forget who caused all this. It, it's, it's, it's Putin's Russia. It's um, the Kremlin with this dictator behind, hiding behind the Kremlin walls who initiated this uh, completely unprovoked aggression against Ukraine. And you were quite right, Ali, when you, when you commented in your introductory remarks saying it is not only a an aggression against uh, the Ukrainians, which would be bad enough. It's an aggression against all of us, at least uh, against those who believe in universal values, like rule of law, democracy, human rights, and all these things. So we are defending, or actually Ukrainians are defending on Ukrainian territory our core values. So for me, it's an absolutely no-brainer to make quick and right decisions and to support Ukraine as much as we can to bring them into a strong position. There cannot be peace negotiations now. So clear and very stern words uh, from uh, Peter Bayer as far as the German perspective is concerned. Of course, we are here today to discuss uh, the, the future of the European Union and European security after the Ukraine war. But let's get a snapshot still because we're not quite there yet. Bogdan Klitsch, Poland is a country obviously that has been heavily impacted by this war. I know your country has taken in a large influx of uh, Ukrainian refugees, um, has been warning uh, about uh, Russia and Vladimir Putin in particular for many years, something that perhaps some of your European partners did not take to heart. Let's get a quick snapshot from uh, the view from Warsaw as well, and <coughs> before we dive into what this war actually means for the future of the EU. I don't want to exaggerate, but uh, it was last year here during this conference that we were talking also about uh, the Russian threat and uh, I warned about uh, not only militarization of the foreign policy of uh, the Russian Federation, but also uh, on plans uh, of Vladimir Putin to reintegrate as biggest part of uh, the former Soviet Union, including Ukraine as an indispensable part of this, uh, of this plan. By the way, I mentioned also the soft annexation of Belarus that at that time mm. was almost uh, completed. But uh, let's say frankly that uh, prob probably even in November or December, nobody expected such a... There was a... <coughs> it was CIA that knew uh, from the very beginning of uh, November and shared this uh, uh, those informations with uh, partners in, uh, in Europe about full-scale war that was planned by uh, Vladimir Putin, but we believed rather that there will be an uh, operation uh, limited to the southern and uh, eastern part of, uh, uh, of Ukraine, uh, uh, 
not with the operational goal that is uh, so uh, so visible right now because the operational goal of this uh, uh, of this war of Vladimir Putin against uh, Ukraine is to destroy the statehood uh, of Ukrainian uh, of Ukrainian state and to uh, exterminate its uh, inhabitants i underlined it because uh, uh, we witness not we observe not only war crimes we observe not only crimes against humanity in uh, in Ukraine, uh, not only in Bucha, Irpin, uh, not only in Hostomel, uh, uh, in Mariupol and other places, but everywhere in uh, in that country. But we also see the examples of genocide, uh, genocide there, and it was expressed several times very clearly by uh, either Putin himself or his. Uh, uh, his uh, 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 collaborators. Uh, but there are two other uh, operational goals that are important uh, not only for Ukraine, but also for European and Atlantic community. I would say destabilization of the European Union and paralysis of, uh, of NATO. They were expressed uh, just before the beginning of this full-scale war in Ukraine in the famous ultimatum of President uh, Putin to, uh, to the West. Uh, so, uh, uh, from Polish perspective, if you uh, ask about that, uh, this is the war that, uh, uh, that refers not only to Ukrainian nation, not only to Ukrainian statehood, but also to the European Union and Atlantic community as a, as a whole. That's why we are uh, satisfied with, the, uh, with three uh, important uh, uh, new factors. The first one, it is the return of the United States to Europe. President Biden declared that during his campaign, and he did it uh, at least since uh, June 2021, when, uh, as we remember, when he paid his first visit to Europe, uh, taking part in three summits, G7 summit, uh, uh, NATO summit, but also the European Council. Also the European Council, and uh, there are consequences of, uh, of that. That's first. Secondly, uh, uh, the important uh, consequence of, uh, of this war was uh, political reintegration of, uh, of the Alliance. Uh, NATO was uh, split uh, during uh, President uh, Trump's uh, uh, presidency uh, strip, uh, uh, very deeply. There was a military unity and uh, because of uh, military commanders of uh, NATO, uh, the alliance uh, went ahead, but there was a political split and the lack of political unity. So after the beginning of the war in Ukraine, NATO presented itself as, a, as an integrated entity. And the third one, it is the reaction of the European Union, frankly speaking, as a chair of the Foreign Affairs and the European Union's uh, Committee of Polish Senate, I haven't seen before such a speed, such an acceleration of, an, uh, of <coughs> the legislative process concerning uh, external threats, Ukraine mainly, that in only in two weeks uh, from the beginning by the European Commission to the, to the final decision of the European uh, Union's uh, Council, there is, uh, uh, there, the main acts are adopted and uh, uh, such a big amount of money that was allocated from the, US, uh, from the European Peace Facility to support Ukraine, it means uh, 3.1 uh, billion euro for military expenses only for military expenses how, how much did you say 3.1 only for military yeah. expenses from the european peace no. facility i don't <coughs> mention you know uh, more than uh, uh, 13 uh, billion euro from uh, for the microeconomic uh, aid and those that were designed for next year i mean at least 18 billion but euro the epf it would be yeah. is around 4.6 yeah. i mentioned you know the european peace facility yeah, the EPF with 3.1 yeah. it's more than that now yeah. But Europe, I, I think the point, uh, figures aside, uh, the point you're making is quite clear. Europe has uh, acted uncharacteristically, perhaps, acted swiftly, uh, uh, moving around the red tape that often uh, uh, 
involves uh, decision making in Brussels and has uh, acted uh, with uh, decision uh, and resolve here. Uh, Bogdan Klitsch, thank you so much. I will come back to you, of course, uh, as this discussion involves. I want to bring in Hubert Vedrin, the former foreign minister here for a second, and ask him not also about the view from Paris, but about some of the lessons that we as Europeans have learned uh, since February 24th. What are some of the major uh, lessons, some of the major points that you would observe and, and, and see? Alors, d'abord, dans la table ronde, on est censé... 4.6 now. We'll just take a minute. Yeah. Really? Yeah. J'attends que... Dans cette table ronde, on est censé réfléchir sur le futur. Or, c'est difficile de penser l'après-guerre parce qu'il n'y a pas de solution à cette guerre. Le plus probable, c'est l'enlisement. Et moi, je ne crois pas du tout à court terme à des négociations, encore moins une solution. Donc, ce n'est pas de l'après-guerre, c'est réfléchir à la situation avec une guerre non résolue, un enlisement. Ça, ça c'est le premier point. Euh, D'autre part, la, de, la décision aberrante de Poutine nous ramène au début de la guerre froide, à mon avis. La première période de la guerre froide qui a duré très longtemps, avant les débuts des négociations. Parce que l'Occident, à l'époque, était réaliste, était capable de négocier en défendant ses intérêts. D'ailleurs, à la fin, c'est l'Occident qui a gagné. Et on n'est même pas dans la phase des accords Schultz, Start, etc. On est avant, on est au tout début. Donc il faut réétudier les années 50, à mon avis, pour comprendre une situation tout à fait durable. Ensuite, l'avenir de l'Europe, c'est l'avenir de l'OTAN, en fait. Parce que la conséquence immédiate de l'attaque de Poutine, c'est que l'OTAN, l'Alliance, l'OTAN, à la demande de tout le monde, réabsorbe l'ensemble du sujet européen, pour le moment, en matière de défense. Et il me semble que, pour un certain temps, il n'y a plus aucune base politique pour les idées, entre guillemets, à la française, ou les idées européennes sur une certaine autonomie de l'Europe par rapport à ça, en matière de défense. En revanche, là où l'Europe a un boulevard devant elle, à mon avis, c'est sur la question de la réduction des dépendances excessives, parce qu'on l'a vu avec la pandémie, on le voit avec le gaz russe, etc., on le voit avec les céréales, et donc là, il y a un boulevard en matière technologique, en matière de reconstruction d'une relative autonomie européenne. Mais ce n'est pas la défense, ce n'est pas la sécurité. Donc comme la période qui s'ouvre, ça se passe à l'intérieur de l'OTAN, de l'Alliance Atlantique, sans oublier que pour les États-Unis, le problème numéro un demeure la Chine, même si les Européens ont du mal à intégrer cette notion. Il suffit de regarder ce que dit de temps en temps Biden ou Blinken, ou le chef d'état-major Millet, et ce qu'ils disent n'est pas très différent de ce que dit Macron, en fait. Et de temps en temps, Scholz, ça dépend. Voyez Donc, en tout cas, là, il faut oublier, pour tous les gens qui sont là, des, des décennies de discours sur la défense européenne. Elle est assurée par l'OTAN, <coughs> comme à l'origine, quand les Européens avaient demandé euh, que ce soit les États-Unis qui les protègent en dépit des progrès, en dépit des efforts, en dépit des procédures, etc. C'est etc. comme ça que je vois la, la période qui vient. Jusqu'au moment où les Européens, même les Polonais, vont se dire c'est peut-être pas prudent de penser que les États-Unis sont protégés à perpétuité, donc il faut quand même rebâtir quelque chose nous-mêmes. Mais on n'en est pas là. On n'est pas dans cette phase, parce que l'urgence du moment, c'est de bloquer Poutine et qu'il ne puisse pas gagner. Mais je reviens à ce que j'ai dit avant, donc en lisement. Voilà, donc je pense qu'il y a une, une grande ouverture, mais pas défense. Je change un peu de sujet. Technologie, tous les domaines de dépendance excessive. Par ailleurs, sur la période, je le dis souvent, je pense qu'il faut réfléchir sur la politique occidentale menée depuis la fin de l'URSS, donc sur 30 ans, et pas uniquement sur les derniers mois, ni les dernières années, et je pense que cette analyse n'est pas faite, que tous ceux qui tentent de le faire en Occident sont considérés comme étant indulgents par rapport à Poutine, ce qui n'est pas le cas. Personne que je connais n'est indulgent par rapport à Poutine. Mais un Occident qui ne serait pas capable d'évaluer 
des politiques menées, par exemple dans les années 90, c'est un Occident qui m'inquiète. Il faut faire ce que les militaires appellent le retour d'expérience. Il y a eu plusieurs politiques depuis le début des années 90. Il ne faut pas mélanger Yeltsin, Poutine 1, Poutine 2, Medvedev, etc. etc. Je ne vais pas au-delà, parce que tout le monde comprend, mais dans les débats en Europe, c'est des débats impossibles à mener. Il faut donc se référer à ce que disent les Américains, qui sont souvent très vieux, qui sont des vétérans de la guerre froide, qui ont combattu toute leur vie, mais qui sont capables de faire cette analyse pour réintroduire dans le débat pour l'avenir. Il faut analyser ce que l'Occident a fait par rapport à la Russie, par rapport à la Chine, par rapport au Moyen-Orient, etc. Moi, je suis sur cette ligne tout en disant à chaque fois que ce n'est pas le moment. Ce n'est pas le moment. Quant à l'avenir, je, je redis et je termine, il me semble qu'il y a une certaine correspondance entre ce que Macron dit tout, dans de temps en temps, alors je ne dis pas que je défends toutes les déclarations, il y en a qui le feraient mieux de ne pas faire maintenant, en attendant la suite. Euh, donc Macron ou, ou Scholz, est ce que pense la Maison-Blanche, il me semble. Thank you so much. Obviously, the, the French-German uh, access here is ex extremely important in uh, uh, guaranteeing the unified front, Zaki Laidi. The, the European Union has been praised since February 24th, as has Bogdan Klitsch once again reiterated here on stage, that it has presented a unified front, that it has been able to act swiftly. Um, give us a sense of the discussions as much as you can from behind the doors, of course, to bring 27 nations together at a time like this and speak with one voice could, cannot be easy and could not have been easy. Uh, I know you're working at, at that front very diligently together with the high representative. Um, is the unified front of substance or do we see cracks in it already? No, I think that the level of consensus in Europe is uh, extraordinarily high, extraordinarily high. And uh, just to give you an example, uh, it took two months, only two months, to set up the military mission uh, to Ukraine. Whereas usually when we send missions to Africa, Uh, it takes uh, one year or 18 months. But if you allow me, if uh, I would like to make a certain comments regarding the meaning of this conflict. Because if we don't concentrate and analyze the meaning of this conflict, I'm afraid that we're not going to be able to think about the, re the, the question we raise, which is the way out. Okay, so if you allow me, I will make a few remarks. First, in terms of global meaning, this war fundamentally, fundamentally marks the second death of the Soviet Union. This is for me the most important uh, provisional conclusion. So, in terms of meaning, This war, and we have to recall it, is a war of aggression conducted by a permanent member of the Security Council against an independent and sovereign state which the Russia was supposed to guarantee the security, the integrity, including, including Crimea through the Budapest Memorandum of 1994, which carried a, a risk for Ukraine, because in exchange of this, it relinquished its nuclear equipment. So the cost for Ukraine was extremely high. And since we are in an Arab country, in the Gulf, the best comparison is the invasion of Kuwait by uh, Saddam Hussein in 1994. 91. Now, second, the rationale of the war. Why Putin wage that war? You need to read what Putin said. And he wrote a very interesting piece 
written in July 2021, which actually other Russians could have written. For example, Solzhenitsyn, of course, with much more talent, which means that the Ukrainian problem is not the simply a Putin problem. It would be a deep mistake. It's a Russian problem. And what Putin said is extremely clear. He said that Ukraine should not exist because Russia, Ukraine, Belarus belong to the same ensemble. <coughs> they are the same nation. And as you know, the Russians call the Ukrainian the little Russians, and they call the Belarus people the white Russians. So in his mind, in his mind, they are part of the same nation because this is part of an imperial vision of the Russian world. Now, the question you could raise is, why did he wait 2022 to wage this terrible war, which fortunately, which fortunately went miserably for the Russian army? The date, the chronology of the war, it had been launched on February 24th. And the day before the invasion, he made a declaration in which he said that Russia will support, recognize and support militarily the two puppet governments of the east of Ukraine. And, and I am amazed to see that nobody knows why he made this statement on the 23rd of February. And I raised the question to all audience here. Could you tell me why this declaration had been made on the 23rd of February? So I'm going, going to give you the answer because even the ministers of uh, foreign affairs, Europeans, were not aware of this coincidence. And it gives you an idea of the meaning of the war. The 23rd of February refers to the eighth anniversary of the fall of the pro-Russian regime in Ukraine. The day Yukashenko left Ukraine. Yanukovych. And Yanukovych. And the day after, it was the beginning of the democratic process. So, uh, the question is often raised, okay, they, they didn't accept the independence of Ukraine, but what did they wait 2022? Here again, the explanation is quite simple. As long as the political trajectory of Ukraine was compatible with the nature of the Russian regime, it was possible for Russia to manage the situation as they manage the situation in Belarus, okay? But since 2014, the political trajectory of Ukraine became very different, far from the Russian evolution. And then started the danger to which Russia answered through the annexation of Crimea and launch the famous green man in uh, the east of, of, uh, of Ukraine. So that is the reason why he launched this, uh, 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 this war. So on our side, on our side, did we make mistakes? Yes, we made a lot of mistakes. And let me mention those mistakes, sorry to give this background, but without this background, we cannot have a serious discussion on Ukraine. The first is, and in my view, and I, by, the, by, by the way, I'm expressing here myself on a personal basis, not reflecting the views of the HIVP. So please do not quote me in a way or another. So first, we didn't have, we never had a Ukrainian policy. Our Ukrainian policy was a byproduct of our Russian policy. And 
it led to a certain number of uncertainty, to a certain number of mistakes, hesitations, including the question of uh, NATO, I mean, to which personally I'm not favorable in the case of uh, Ukraine. But we didn't give right and clear, precise indication. The second and big mistake is that we didn't react to the occupation of Crimea, which I remind is part of Ukraine. Because even after the during the referendum of independence, 54% of the population of Crimea voted for the independence. Of course, the figure was much, much lower than the other regions of Russia, of Ukraine, but still, the majority was favorable. So, we didn't react, and, and, and the worst is that the sanction against Russia after Crimea didn't come after the occupation of Crimea, but after the shutting down of the, the plane. Third, I will be brief on this, the terrible mistake we made was to increase our dependency on energy on Russia right. after Crimea, yeah. after Crimea. And of course, we can fully understand the reasoning of Mr. Putin, who says that those Europeans are not uh, uh, reacting swiftly. And I think that one of, I mean, he virtually made after that all the mistakes possible, but he underestimated the role of the United States. But just, and, and I will just uh, finish on this, uh, and I hope that we will be able to come on the way out. Uh, the, the commitment of the EU is dramatically underestimated. I'm virtually sure that, ma that the majority here of the, the attendants believe that the American support is more important than the European one. It's false. The last figure published by the Keele Institute at the end come to the point to, and said that the, uh, co the commitments of the European Union on the economic side and the military one are superior to the commitment of the United States. Right. Sorry. Well, well, thank you so much. I mean, obviously, this uh, was a the, the background, the historical background that you've provided, cer certainly key here. Um, and, and the last point about the Europeans actually stepping up to the plates uh, and uh, their aid having uh, at least equal, equal weight as far as Washington's contribution is concerned is, is taken, uh, is well noted here. We have 45 minutes uh, left in this discussion, certainly. Um, I, I do want to go through uh, one more round and take some questions from the audience members. So, uh, President Elbeck Dorsch, it, it might seem uh, peculiar at first uh, to have the former president of Mongolia right. speak <laughs> on a panel about the future of the European Union. But um, for those who may not be familiar with it, you spent a long time, many years in Ukraine, and as a former president of Mongolia, have met. Vladimir Putin have met President Putin many, many times, over 30 times, I believe, throughout your reign. Um, since we're talking about the future of the European Union and the implications um, to European security, uh, give us an outsider perspective here as somebody who knows Ukraine very well, but also knows President Vladimir Putin very well. Uh, thank you very much. You know, this Ukrainian war has a global implication. If there was not Ukrainian war, I think uh, maybe Chinese President Xi Jinping started forceful unification with Taiwan yesterday. I think now Chinese leader weighing in two ways and facing two scenarios. First is scenario, if uh, forceful unification of Taiwan with China happens like in the 2014 Crimea, he would have started that process yesterday. But uh, now he sees that it might be like a different scenario, 2022 scenario, like a let's Putin scenario. And he's weighing that. Means that Ukrainian war has a great 
greater implication, not only in Europe, then also worldwide, also in Asia. Also, there are other connections, Mongolia, Ukraine. There is only one country between us. Ukraine is a free uh, democratic country, independent country in uh, Europe. Mongolia is a free independent democratic country in Asia. And between us, I told you that uh, one country and uh, means that uh, we are sharing common interest. Also, you know, global implications means that Ukrainian war actually, that uh, front line, Ukrainian war front line is much more wider. It's front line between the free world and authoritarian world. It runs even in Africa, it runs in uh, Asia, it runs everywhere. If uh, Ukraine loses, I think those autocrats will be encouraged. If Ukraine wins, those autocrats will be will uh, discouraged. Now I think uh, you even see that uh, President Xi Jinping is, uh, from the latest news, uh, he is still distancing from the from the Putin and trying to build more connections with the Western countries. It means that Ukraine is fighting not only for Ukraine but it's uh, fighting for the global faith of the humanity. That's very important. And the other thing, also Mongolia is only democratic and fully functioning democracy between Russia and China since 1990. I think uh, why Putin started the invasion of Ukraine is one of the reasons that uh, if free Ukraine, if prosperous Ukraine, there in Europe, I think it's going to be a bad example for Russia. I know that uh, one day this war will end, and one day we will see more liberal Russia. If Russia became more liberal, more freedom-minded, if in Russia there are some, some kind of democratic development, I think Ukraine will have greater impact from the European side. Mongolia will have much more greater impact from the eastern side, from the Asian side. And uh, Ukraine will uh, liberate Russia from the dictatorship, from the European side. Mongolia will liberate. We will have influence on Russia from the Asian side. Means that even though there are countries are small, but those, those examples are, uh, examples of uh, freedom is greater. And because of that, I think this uh, Ukrainian war, uh, war has a big, big implications. And now this war is getting, having a more uglier pace, you know. Now they are really directly targeting the, those infrastructures and energy, everything, and trying to uh, freeze Ukrainians uh, to that. And uh, I think we need to help Ukraine. We need to help Ukraine more than any other time, you know, since, since starting the war. And uh, now I'm the, like a member of the Club de Madrid and I'm the newest member of the elders and we are working to raise, to help Ukraine. If, if we are talking here, I think if you can think about that, uh, if you send one generator right. to Ukrainian city, one, one thing to Ukrainian city, that will save thousands of lives. And uh, I hope I saw that in, uh, within the speakers there is Foreign Minister Kuleba is coming. Yeah. And I lived in Ukraine for many years in Western Ukraine, studied there. I know the spirit of the Ukrainian people. They are really proud people. They are never going to kneel uh, under aggression. And uh, they are showing. And uh, I am really happy that World Policy Conference bringing right. this topic into this uh, into this light. And, and thank and you very much. Uh, thank you. And and uh, the the point about we have uh, 40 minutes left. I'm going to do one quick uh, one quick round here, but with the plea of relatively short answers because I do want to get to the audience because helping Ukraine, Peter, by I think it is a key here. Right now, winter is coming. Winter is here. May not feel like that in Abu Dhabi, but certainly in Berlin. Uh, we've already uh, talked about the failures on the part of some uh, uh, European governments to diversify their energy uh, sources. Germany is now in a conundrum. The question I want to ask you is the support 
for Ukraine on the part of the German people is high if you're looking at the polls. But as the living costs are rising and the immediate impact of those costs are felt by the average person, do you fear that the support for this war, or rather for the Ukrainian people, is going to decline in, in Germany? Because that, that's going to be a litmus test here. Yeah, it's a very good question. And certainly one of the things that any government, not only the one in Germany, has to take into consideration when shaping, forming their policies and making these political decisions that are necessary. I don't, I, I mean, it's a support, as you quite rightly described, for supporting Ukraine in this war with regard to financial aid, with regard to military aid, is very high in Germany. And actually for politicians, it's always a wise thing to really listen with all senses open um, uh, to those um, who they represent, to the people. And just to give you a little example of the very early weeks of that war, when in Germany, uh, after, the German, uh, after, the, 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 after the invasion on uh, February 24th, three days later, the German Chancellor delivered a fantastic speech with everything put in it, uh, you know, with regard to the so-called Zeitenwende, completely change in, in our politics in Germany. And people ask on the street, Do, would you support deliver weapons, especially weapons, uh, to Ukraine? Because of our history, what I alluded to in my introductory remarks, because of we just don't do that, deliver weapons into war zones. German people said, well, we don't like weapons, we know we're more pacific, on the, pass, uh, on the uh, pacific side, but um, we think it's, it would be the right thing to do, because we want to, I think the German the people, the society understands much better, maybe only from a gut feeling, maybe not only like intellectually reflected, what needs to be done. So yes, support is high, but certainly that's that's concern. We not, not only have energy prices shooting through the roof, and it's only just the beginning, I have to say. Next winter, the, the, by the end of next year, will be much more expensive. We have an um, inflation rate um, in the double-digit figures, which is like around 10% in Germany, uh, and many other things. And this taken together, it's really a challenge um, for any government, be it on a federal level, be it on a like, more regional or local level, to hold the society together. But, well, that's the responsibility uh, to communicate, okay, to explain to the constituents why it is necessary. Because of all the good reasons that I heard from the panel, um, it's not just about the Ukraine, which would be a cause enough to, to, to support or defend, but it's, uh, you know, we, 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 are, we are fighting, the Ukrainians are defending our, ourselves here. And uh, let's be very clear. Um, Vladimir Putin and Russia will not stop um, at the borders of Ukraine as a sovereign state. And I have not heard yet the, the, uh, the, the name of the Republic of, of Moldova, which are, is also a country, and the Baltic states, which are really threatened, not only since this year, they have really, they, 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 they really uh, are frightened of what's, what's happening, and they have suffered a lot under under Russian uh, suppression. So it's very concrete, it's very clear, um, and uh, that's a responsibility of those, all those uh, who have been elected into these um, top positions uh, to lead their states and hold the societies together in their own territory, but beyond their borders, within the European Union. And, and uh, really, I mean, European Union, there's so much talk all the time, not on this panel here, but, but you know, European Union, is this over? Does it have a future? And all this blah, blah, blah. I, 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 you know, why not giving the good examples of the European Union? It's, the, it's a guarantor for peace, stability, and yep. prosperity in the, in the so-called old continent. Very successful, and it has proved to be, just in that very situation, what the senior advisor to the high reps said, just said. And that's true, it's not just like uh, wishful thinking, it's reality, but of course it's also here, only the, just the beginning. We have to think about what's, what's, what's after that war, um, what, what, what is our concept, what is our idea, the vision for the next 30, 50 years of the European Union. We are a decreasing population, and, uh, but we are, we, we are also an economic powerhouse. There's a lot of opportunities and options, we just need, and we'll finish with that. Um, we have to look around for reinforcements of old alliances, and we have to you know, pursue paths of new alliances, be it in the Indo-Pacific, 
or be it a, uh, in, in Latin America and elsewhere. The, the rethinking part, obviously a very important one, not just uh, in, in Germany, but Europe in, in general. Germany will be interesting to see whether, as you pointed out, uh, Peter Bayer, whether it can shed its uh, pac pacifistic attitude, uh, which obviously <coughs> was, was in existence and in place for good reasons yeah. post 45, but these are different times now, which may require a different uh, attitude, uh, Bogdan Klisch. Uh, are you concerned? I, I'm going to come to you in, a, in just a second. Are you concerned about the level of support on the part of European states and perhaps more importantly the European people as far as uh, staying strong with Ukraine as long as this takes? Without doubt it's a, it is a much better uh, than at the beginning of the war. It means that uh, there is a growing understanding in Europe, not only in some parts of Europe, uh, of the role of Ukraine and uh, uh, the principle that uh, security of Europe depends on independence of Ukraine. The security of, uh, of European Union at least depends on independence and territorial integrity of, of Ukraine. For many years it was a principle you know, of our Polish Eastern policy, but now I see in uh, in all the member states of both the Alliance and uh, the European Union such, a, such an awareness and this is a good sign. But on the other hand, we have still three challenges that I would like to raise, uh, maybe to discuss uh, with the audience, uh, uh, that happened recently. First of all, it is that there is a kind of division of labor between NATO and the European Union. Although, of course, the European Union once again reacted quickly, reacted uh, extraordinary for the Europe, for the for the for the war, uh, uh, Russian war in Ukraine. There is a growing uh, a growing consciousness that the European Union should be mainly responsible for crisis management uh, uh, missions when collective security is and will be in the hands of uh, of NATO. When President Macron uh, presents such a, such a stance, uh, this is symptomatic for, for, uh, for Europe. When in the, uh, in the new strategic uh, concept, uh, although in the new strategic concept of the alliance, the crisis management was still put uh, in an important place, after the, uh, the, the fatigue uh, of uh, uh, out-of-area missions, mainly in uh, Afghanistan, I cannot imagine, you know, that there would be an engagement of NATO in crisis management type missions uh, out of area in future, when in the strategic compass we have a clear definition that European Union should be ready to conduct all types of Petersburg missions. Yeah, this is a clear uh, definition of the level of ambition of the European Union. Of course, one can discuss uh, the current uh, stage of uh, capability developments if they are able to achieve uh, uh, all those uh, goals, including peace enforcement missions, including stabilization missions, uh, at least at the scale of uh, Alta mission in, uh, in Bosnia and Herzegovina. But this division of labor for crisis management in the hands of uh, the European Union and uh, collective, uh, the collective security in the hands of NATO is more and more visible. It, it's uh, certainly the division of labor uh, as, uh, as Finland and Sweden are getting ready to, to join the alliance and uh, expanding the sphere of influence of Europe. Thank you, Bogdan Klitsch, for, for pointing that out. Uh, it, it's going to be quite interesting to see how that plays out. Hubert Vetterin, are you concerned about war fatigue I mean, we're sitting here and we're talking about this war which has been raging since February 24th, which has claimed so many lives, but is now feeling more and more real to the European citizens because of the economic ramifications that this war is having. I think on an ideological, emotional level, everybody uh, in Europe, at least predominantly, would exert their support, but do you sense certain war fatigue in France and beyond, Hubert Vedrin? It's uh, to Vedrin? Yes. Huh? Est-ce à vous? 
Non, je ne pense pas. Je suis d'accord avec Zaki Laïdi, qui a rappelé tout à l'heure l'effort énorme des Européens, contrairement à ce qui est dit en général. Et on est censé parler de l'avenir, hein, pas de la conjoncture immédiate, en théorie. Euh, donc moi, je n'ai pas d'inquiétude là-dessus. Je pense que les Européens vont résister. Et je pense que Poutine ne peut pas gagner. Je pense que les Américains ne laisseront pas les Ukrainiens attaquer la Crimée. Je peux me tromper, mais enfin bon, c'est comme ça. C'est pour ça que je crois plutôt à l'enlisement. Et comme je l'ai dit tout à l'heure, au-delà des inquiétudes immédiates, trop conjoncturelles, euh, l'avenir se passe dans le temps. Dans le temps. Donc ça va dépendre des rapports de force au sein de l'OTAN, donc de la position américaine, donc de la position de Biden dans la hiérarchie numéro un. La, la numéro un, la politique intérieure, numéro deux, la Chine, numéro trois, les questions européennes. Donc ils ne laisseront pas Poutine gagner, mais ils ne se laisseront pas entraîner par les Européens dans une confrontation directe. Entre-temps, je ne crois pas que les Européens vont craquer, je pense qu'ils vont, ils vont résister, que même les Ukrainiens vont réussir à résister courageusement à la situation actuelle. Donc pour moi, il y a plus d'interrogations sur la suite, comment on va vraiment gérer la suite, et quelles seront les dissensions prévisibles, déjà visibles, au sein de l'Alliance et de l'OTAN, mais je ne parle pas des opinions publiques. Les opinions elles sont sur la même ligne depuis le début. On ne peut pas laisser gagner Poutine. Et on ne veut pas aller à la guerre avec la Russie. Alors c'est peut-être un peu confus, mais c'est la position dans toutes les opinions, ça. Et je, à mon avis, ça ne changera pas. Donc je ne suis pas spécialement inquiet sur le, la question de la résistance des Européens. Clear words. Uh, before we go into the audience, uh, Zach, I know you wanted to jump in here quickly. Yes. Yeah. Um, yeah, I think uh, that, of course, um, the achievements of Europe had been uh, quite impressive. And in my view, uh, the biggest uh, achievement was to cut our dependency from Russia on oil and gas, because oil and gas have hijacked our Russian policy, something which had been denied by a certain number of member states. But I have to say that those member states, and you know the one I'm referring to, has dramatically changed its, uh, its position, and it's a huge achievement, uh, which needs to be, uh, to be uh, noticed. Now, we, there are obviously many issues in the future, and the role and the strategic responsibility of Europe is going to be a key question for the future of our security. <coughs> Indeed. NATO is absolutely crucial, and Mr. Putin made it larger, but still, NATO in itself is not going to be the solve the problems of the security of Europe, meaning that Europeans need to take more responsibility, not against NATO, but even within NATO, but we need to have a strong European pillar without NATO, capable, capable of dealing with what the uh, French military said, to be prepared to a war of high intensity in Europe. And this, is going to, this war is going to have see change on the perception and the strategic perception of our security. But indeed, we need to take more responsibility. Europe taking more responsibility, I think, is something that Washington also is, is very receptive to as far as um, it, it's uh, constant plea in previous years for Europeans to step up to the plate is concerned. That is certainly music to Washington's ears. Considering the time that we have, we're going to, uh, and I would ask the panelists to take notes because I'm going to combine the questions. We're not going one by yeah, one, yeah, yeah. but we're going to combine them. 
So microphones are on standby, I believe. Uh, Steve, why don't you go first? I'm going to come to all of you, uh, and we're going to collect the questions, and then I'm going to throw it back for one last um, Q&A session with the audience. Steve, go ahead. Ali, thank you, and thank you to the panel, which has been very good, by the way. Uh, I do want to throw it more to the future. Um, the war will eventually end. It will end in negotiations, but there is already disagreement in the alliance about how we treat Russia afterward. Do we have European security against Russia? Do we have European security with Russia? Do we have European security with America, though worried about China? The big question is, what happens to Russia after this war, which is a much more interesting question, frankly. Will it be a new time of troubles? Will it disintegrate? Uh, what will that do? Um, but mostly, I just want to get people to talk about how you look at Russia post-conflict mm -hmm. in relationship to European security and what kind of security guarantees can you provide Ukraine if, as Zaki Laidi says, outside NATO? I don't think they exist myself, but perhaps I'm wrong. Thank you. Th thank you, Steve. A question we would be happy to incorporate. Uh, what does security with Russia look like afterwards? Uh, how does Russia look? What does uh, Russia look like? The microphone thing is being passed. We're, we're moving to both sides. Go ahead. Yes, yes. Go ahead, please. Hey. Bonjour, merci pour ce panel passionnant. Deux questions rapides. La première a été par sur la remarque de M. Sakilaïdi sur le réarmement européen. Est-il vraiment crédible au-delà de l'émotion que l'on a aujourd'hui Parce qu'on voit bien que autant ou pas autant, il euh, n'y a aucun avenir dans notre relation à la Russie sans une force militaire en Europe très puissante. Alors là, il y a beaucoup d'émotions, mais est-ce que ça va durer au vu de l'ampleur des budgets que nous avons refusé jusqu'à présent de consacrer à ces sujets qu'il va falloir consacrer. Et deuxième question très rapide, l'Union européenne, l'intégration de l'Ukraine dans l'Union européenne. Ce sujet n'a pas été mentionné, on l'a admis, on sait tous quelle est la réalité de l'économie et des institutions ukrainiennes. Nous nous sommes engagés dans une promesse politique dont on voit bien qu'elle est absolument incontournable, mais elle est-elle réalisable Or, cette intégration fait partie inévitablement d'une vision de moyen long terme de notre relation avec euh, l'Est de l'Europe. Thank you so much. Microphone is coming all the way. I'm going to get everyone in, I promise. Go ahead. Yes, uh, Hervé Mariton, uh, two quick comments and a question. Uh, there's uh, unanimity in Europe in uh, supporting Ukraine, uh, and this will be helped by the good qualification of events. I would react to the fact that uh, events have been qualified by one of the members of the panel as genocide, for example. Is there a war crime on the scene? Uh, alas, yes, obviously, and this has to be condemned. Is there humanitarian crime? This can be discussed. Is there a genocide? I do not believe that qualifying events this way helps supporting European unanimity uh, in the uh, situation. This is the first point. The second comment, when you alluded to Solzhenitsyn, if I may, uh, Solzhenitsyn never denied the existence of Ukraine as an independent state. He just said that probably this would be a difficult period, that there might be war, and that he would oppose his sons participating in the war. That is what he precisely wrote, if I may say. The question is, particularly from a French point of view, uh, but it goes beyond. Uh, as the panel uh, emphasized, uh, the war has made the penny about NATO drop. For the French, for example, uh, NATO was very often denied. French politicians uh, talking about uh, defense and defense in Europe very seldom uh, spoke about NATO, just as if France did not belong to NATO, actually. And now the penny has dropped, and I believe this is a good thing. But as to Europe, and Hubert Hedrin uh, emphasized that the panel is supposed to be about the future, uh, I would uh, ask the panel how 
the uh, value the present situation, for example, when uh, you've got a Franco-German uh, corporation on SCAF, and uh, just about the same time an important announcement is made on this, you've got the Italian, British, Japanese uh, corporation on a competitor to SCAF, for example. So Europe seems to be united presently, but if we look to the future, the uh, division in Europe on industrial issues and others regarding security seem to be just as strong as ever. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, moving the mic along. Yes, please go ahead. D'accord. Si vous permettez, je vais parler en français. Je voudrais poser une question à Hubert Védrine à partir de, de ce débat intéressant. Je crois que dans cette guerre, certainement, la Russie qui a agressé euh, l'Ukraine va sortir affaiblie. Même si elle est européenne de culture, il y, a une, il y aura une rupture de confiance entre l'Europe et la Russie. Et la Russie, de plus en plus, va se déployer vers l'Asie, l'Inde et la Chine et les autres. Alors pour moi, est-ce que ça n'est pas une opportunité, bien sûr, pour l'Europe D'une part, de s'intégrer, de se renforcer, d'avoir une politique stratégique commune, etc. Mais d'autre part, surtout, pour moi, de s'intéresser à son autre géographie, c'est-à-dire le Sud, à la nécessité pour l'Europe de se réconcilier avec le monde arabe et avec l'Afrique. C'est avec ce monde qu'elle va pouvoir même gérer peut-être sa transition, toutes ses transitions, les transitions énergétiques entre autres, en dehors du fait qu'elle a intérêt que le problème du développement et de la Méditerranée soit résolu. Merci. Thank you so much. I think the young gentleman right next to you had a question. We'll get him the microphone. Can I see a show of hands? Whom am I missing here? Right here in the first row. And then the young gentleman. Why don't you go ahead? Yeah, while she's getting the mic. Thank you very much. I think it's quite telling to see that only French speakers are talking about European defense and independence indeed. And it's quite disheartening actually to see that Germany, for instance, is pouring billions of dollars into American fighter jets, although other opportunities are available in Europe, not just mentioning the Rafale. But in, in fact, is it just because we listen too much to De Gaulle that as French people, we dream of a European independence? Or does it translate into English as well? That's probably a question for the foreign speakers here in the panel. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. Go ahead. Uh, Dania Khatib, I have mostly a comment more than a question, and I want to make an analogy between Germany and Russia. For following uh, First World War and Germany, when Germany was humiliated and was plunging in hyperinflation, this led to the rise of a belligerent figure like Hitler, where in, after Second World War, when Germany was treated with respect and we had the Marshall Plan, we had a peaceful, prosperous Germany. Uh, so, I mean, this is a great panel, but I don't see uh, like the Russian perspective. I speak a lot with Russians, and they have a lot of grievances. They were promised, if you talk to a Russian, they, he will tell you uh, Gorbachev was promised the moon, uh, you know, that if he will gonna dissolve the Soviet Union, we're gonna have prosperity, and but all this resulted in sweet lies. So. Uh, all what I'm saying, I hope that Ukraine will win, but I also, I hope that Russia, after that, I go back to Stephen's question, will be treated with respect, with humility, just in order not to have Putin 2.0, because a defeat of Russia doesn't mean it's going to become more peaceful. Thank yeah. you. Th thank you okay. so much. I, I believe, unless I have overlooked anything, I believe we have everyone here. Everybody will get their share, being mindful of uh, the time, of course. Uh, Peter, why don't you kick it off and then yeah. we'll, we'll get everyone in here for the one last round. So thank, thanks for that really uh, great set of questions I'm, I'm, I'm a, and comments. So I'm trying to uh, pick some of them. And, and, of course, and, and, those and, and, pertaining, yeah, everybody, exactly. everybody pertaining so actually to their field. The, 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 the first question, the last one, were actually referring to um, how to deal with Russia after the war, once it's over. So what's the future been? 
our relation with that, with that huge country, with these um, many, many millions of, of Russians. But look, I mean, Russia is a, is, a, is, is a proud nation with a lot of history, tradition, um, and we had good relationships before that, but matter of fact is the um, change through trade concept approach that we tried with the hand reached out, it uh, didn't work out. Um, Putin's Russia betrayed the world, and they were like free riding on that. Yeah, so there were stupid mistakes, and that had been alluded to earlier, that we did, especially in Germany, to, to increase our dependency, especially when it comes to, to Russian oil and gas. Um, so, so, I mean, obviously there needs to be a future relationship with Russia. This, the, the country, and its people especially, cannot be ignored. Uh, we need to have something, I, I hate to say, I hate to use that, that, that term, but for lack of a better one, is we need something like an off-ramp, and I'm not talking to, to, uh, uh, with regard to Vladimir Putin, but for the nation, for the country, for the people of Russia, which I have respect for. But, you know, it's way too early, and now I try to connect that with the, the first question with the, with the last one. This is absolutely not the time to talk about respect, treat, you know, respectful treatment of Russia. Absolutely. They are the aggressors. And um, Russia is, you know, I, in the beginning we talked about, uh, in the beginning of the war, we talked about, well, it's, it's Putin's war. But as has been said on the panel earlier, it's not only Putin's war, he gets a lot of support. It's, it's Russia against Ukraine and the rest of the world, basically. So I think uh, we should not give, I should totally disagree, to give Russia, any representative of Russia, a platform on this conference or any other uh, at this point in time to, you know, lobby for themselves. They have to first <coughs> stop that war. And then, then we could talk about re respectful treatment, of, uh, about an off-ramp, and about all else. Stop that war, and then it's only the time to do that. Um, and I would, uh, there, was an, uh, there, was a, there was a question and a comment with regard to rearmament of Europe. Uh, if that would be realistic, um, taking into account the, uh, uh, the defense investment pledge, that which means that by the time of 2024, NATO member states should increase their uh, budget, uh, 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 defense budget, um, uh, to 2% at least uh, of GDP. You know, it, you know being, being from Germany, a German parliamentarian, there was a lot of things that we did not do in the past, especially during the term of uh, President Donald Trump. We were heavily criticized by not doing enough, and um, on the merits, he was right. But just the style was not really uh, good. Um, we increased our defense budgets, uh, budgets over those uh, past several years tremendously, tremendously, really, by, by uh, at least 50%, and we are stepping up to that. And um, I, I, we are fully committed to reach that 2% goal and keep that. German Chancellor, who is not from my party, but during his speech that I mentioned earlier on the 27th of February, said very clearly, very clearly, from now on, each and every year, Germany will spend 2% of its GDP just for defense, uh, uh, for, for the defense budget. So from my perspective and from a German perspective, uh, let there be no doubt that we will live up to our commitments that we met, also for our own security interests, but also as a commitment uh, uh, as a, to, to our partners with NATO as a reliable partner. And it's very clear from your words that obviously this goes beyond uh, a party being in power or in opposition. This is a unified yeah. German position, stance, and stern and frank words about uh, Russia there, uh, certainly. <coughs> Uh, Bogdan, everybody is going to uh, chime in here before we wrap up. Bog Bogdan uh, Klitsch, go, go ahead. Some of the questions. Steve, frankly speaking, uh, <laughs> there was a great wisdom after the Second World War that was uh, focused in uh, one sentence, beginning with uh, keeping Americans in. I would say that because uh, we witness right now the first uh, full-scale war in Europe after 1949, we should refer to this uh, wording, and my very short answer for your question would be to keep Americans in, Russians down, and make the European Union more stronger. 
Let's think in those categories. Secondly, when you mentioned uh, Mm, sadly, about, uh, about the necessity of uh, reinforcement of the European uh, pillar within NATO, I keep in mind the famous uh, concept of European Security and Defense Identity, ESDI. That according to my understanding of the history is completely outdated. Because uh, after ESDI was uh, Put aside, there was a great beginning of European security and defense policy. Once again, began in 1998 <coughs> after the meeting of Tony Blair and uh, Jacques Chirac. And now we have at our disposal within the European Union common security and defense policy with uh, uh, plenty of instruments, several uh, uh, tools that can be used in a variety of situations, in a variety of uh, options. The problem is still with, uh, uh, with, uh, with funding those tools and with, uh, from time to time, the lack of political will to use them. If we use everything that was uh, included into the Lisbon Treaty, all our achievements after 2017, European Defense Fund, uh, Mechanism Card, uh, 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 other, uh, other uh, tools, EDA. we will be able to be much more effective by the European Union than concentrating on reinforcement of the European pillar within NATO. I don't want to under, undermine the necessity of, uh, let's say, better uh, involvement of European partners within NATO. I'm in favor of reinforcement of CSDP within the European Union and better collaboration between NATO and the European Union in the sense of both declarations from 2016 and from 2018 that created a new framework for the cooperation between those two organizations. Uh, as for the genocide, we discussed that uh, in Europe. If uh, what we witness in Ukraine is or is not genocide, I'm I'm convinced that theoretically and practically in several places in Ukraine, we observe genocide. And when you go to Borodyanka, for example, in, and in this small city, you see five buildings. Three of them were hit because they were of, uh, how to say in, in English, uh, baton pieces, you know, and those pieces, you know, were easier to destroy. And those uh, who were built, uh, that were built of bricks, were not destroyed, was not, were not uh, hit because of uh, uh, this first category of buildings, when hit, it, were easier to murder more people inside. Is it a genocide or not? Is it only a war crime or not? It is a complex extermination of the nation. It is an ideology of the extermination of the nation, theoretically and practically. And let's not forget about that. But even when we don't, uh, uh, if there are controversies con concerning that, mm -hmm. there is one crime that is not assessed and that should be tried by the special tribunal. And this is the, tri the crime of aggression. That's why, together with my colleagues from various parliaments, uh, I mean the chiefs of uh, foreign affairs and European Union committees, <coughs> we call on European governments to create the special tribunal 
to assess the crime of aggression by Vladimir Putin and his uh, inner circle. Thank you. Right. Thank you. Thank you so much. Hubert Vedrin, so, some of the questions were addressed to you directly uh, and uh, President uh, uh, I'm going to come to you, of course, as well as I will to Zaki, being mindful of the time. Go ahead. Alors, je vais réagir très rapidement à la première et à la dernière question me concernant. Sur la première question, l'avenir, je crois que c'était Steve, contre ou avec la Russie. L'esprit de défense a été réveillé euh, en Europe par Poutine. Et donc, la réponse est évidemment contre la Russie. Donc la, la défense de l'Europe est réveillée dans le cadre de l'OTAN par Poutine contre la Russie. Il viendra peut-être un moment, enfin certainement un moment, mais je ne sais pas quand, <coughs> dans un certain temps, il faudra repenser la sécurité avec la Russie comme voisin. Et j'espère qu'à ce moment-là, l'Occident réussira à surmonter son manichéisme, qui est fondamental en Occident, pour avoir la même audace, la même intelligence, la même efficacité stratégique que les grands dirigeants américains de l'époque de la guerre froide, avant l'époque du triomphalisme. Mais ce n'est pas pour maintenant, c'est après et après-demain, je ne sais pas quand. Donc d'abord contre, puis après. Je ne dis pas ce que je souhaite, je dis ce que j'analyse par rapport à ça. À mon avis, en termes de pilier européen, puisque Zaki employait l'expression, euh, ça a reculé. Ce n'est pas une opportunité maintenant, c'est une question qui se reposera après, quand les Européens se poseront des questions sur la, la force et la durabilité de l'engagement américain. Ça, c'est la première question. Mais il faut y travailler. Il y a des éléments, il y a des procédures, il y a des outils. Mais je parle mentalement. Hein. On voit bien ce qu'est l'opinion européenne d'aujourd'hui. Et cette table ronde le montre, d'ailleurs. Sur la question de Fatalouel Alou, opportunité pour l'Europe de s'intéresser au sud, en reprenant l'ancien langage. Je, ne le sens, je le souhaite énormément et je ne le sens pas du tout. Les Européens ne sont pas du tout dans cette phase. Ils sont complètement réoccidentalisés à l'ancienne, à cause des décisions aberrantes de Poutine, mais c'est comme ça. Ils n'ont pas la capacité, ils ne peuvent même pas l'imaginer. Et comme ils sont donc redevenus manichéens suite à l'agression de Poutine, euh, ils ne sont pas capables d'imaginer par rapport aux 40 pays qui n'ont pas condamné la Russie, alors que l'agression est évidente, 40 pays représentant 60% de l'humanité, ils ne sont pas capables d'imaginer une, une politique correspondant à cette, à cette question par rapport aux nouveaux non-alignés. Je pense qu'ils le faudraient, mais ils ne vont pas réagir comme ça. Ils vont essayer de harceler les, les non-alignés de reproches moraux, juridiques, politiques, mais je ne crois pas que l'Europe d'aujourd'hui, au sein de laquelle il y aura une bataille d'influence demain, entre Pologne, Ukraine, France, Allemagne, etc., et tous les autres, je ne crois pas qu'elle soit capable de penser cette politique-là. Et à mon avis, ça va être une nouvelle occasion stratégique manquée. Je regrette d'avoir à dire ça, mais c'est comme ça que je sens les choses, en, dé en dépit des efforts énormes de beaucoup d'Européens. Bon, je regrette d'avoir à dire ça. <rire> Thank you. President Alvector, your final remarks, and then, Mr. Zaki, you're going to get the final word. Yeah, thank you very much. You know, I think since the start of this war, millions of Russian people actually protested against this war. You know, Putin and the Russian people are two different things. Also, with the start of this war, Putin brought big loss in Russia, economic loss, military loss, most importantly, confidence loss in Russia, and that's a very b bad thing. Also, one thing I would like to brought uh, to in light, because you know that mobilization, Russian mobilization, uh, are now more focused. There are more forceful mobilization for ethnic minorities in Russia. Disproportionate ethnic minorities are mobilized to the war in Russia, most of them Originally, origin from the Mongol dissidents, you know, Buryats, Kalmyk, and others mobilized disproportionately uh, to this war. Putin is killing Ukrainians in Ukraine, but in Russia, Putin is uh, killing ethnic minorities in Russia. Putin is using ethnic minorities like a cannon fodder. 
we have to pay to this attention. This is very, very, very important issue. Also, uh, with the start of mobilization, we opened our border to the ethnic minorities, to the people from Russia, to Mongolia. We have big border with Russia. We received thousands of people from Russia. And I think if there is one less man with gun against Ukraine, I think that's also a great contribution for the peace in Russia. And uh, after this uh, war, there will be big uh, kind of the development and uh, big change going to be in Russia. And I think that's still happening in the mindset of people, not only outside of Russia, also inside of Russia. You know, to be part of the Russia or how to, how to deal with these consequences of war. And that, that is indeed the, the, the uh, very important question Steve alerted to it, of course, not only what the future of the European Union will look like, but what the future of Russia will look like once this war is over. On, is the, on the last point on European Union, I think European Union is greatest project which we have our humanity. I think after war, this is the test for European Union. I think after this war, European Union will be more united, more stronger, and uh, also other parts of the world should follow the suit. Yeah. For example, in Asia, we have a 48 United Nations members. We have yeah. not such establishment like in Europe, for example. Yeah. Now, uh, myself and right. other people are contemplating idea to put kind of the Council of Asia idea, you know? How, how about how, how to find kind of consolidation in Asia? Right. In Europe, there are almost uh, yeah, 50 years that consolidation and it will be more stronger. So Great Europe project. will be more yeah. stronger. Is an outside uh, perspective something, Zach Lady, that I'm sure you uh, uh, would attest to? Okay, uh, uh, take it away. I've made my uh, first presentation in English for the sake of uh, francophonie. I will uh, give my answers in uh, French. Bon, sur la Russie, sur la Russie, l'avenir de la Russie, l'avenir la, de la Russie, il dépend d'abord de la Russie. Il dépend d'abord de la Russie. Fondamentalement, quel est le problème de la Russie C'est le renoncement à son identité impériale, au profit d'une identité plus nationale. Je vous invite, si vous ne l'avez pas fait, à lire un article remarquable qui a été écrit il y a plus de 20 ans par un art russe qui s'appelait Alexander Liebed, dans lequel il a clairement poser les termes de l'avenir de la Russie entre une identité nationale déterminée par les frontières de la fédération russe et une identité impériale. Tant que la Russie, tant que la Russie ne fera pas ce travail de rupture, elle aura des problèmes et nous aurons des problèmes avec elle. Alors on va me dire mais c'est très difficile. Mais oui, c'est très difficile. Mais oui, c'est très difficile. Moi, je discute avec, euh, mon, avec euh, Borel tous les jours de ces questions et il me dit, tu sais, pour l'Espagne, la perte de Cuba a été une terrible tragédie. Mais oui, mais oui. La perte de l'Algérie a été pour la France aussi une tragédie. Mais l'Espagne, comme la France, s'en sont sortis en renonçant à leur projet impérial. Il faudra bien qu'un jour, la Russie fasse cet effort qu'elle n'a pas réussi à faire, probablement, probablement à cause de la nature de son régime. Et de toute façon, il n'y a pas que l'Ukraine, il y a ce qui se passe en Asie centrale, où on voit très très bien la volonté de, euh, se, de sortir de l'orbite russe, peut-être pour entrer dans l'orbite chinoise, je ne sais pas s'ils gagneront au change, enfin bon, c'est la dynamique. Donc c'est le passage d'une identité impériale à une identité nationale. Bon, pour ce qui est de la défense européenne, écoutez, moi je reviens de Washington, où nous avons euh, tous les ans un dialogue entre l'Union européenne et les États-Unis sur la Chine au plus haut niveau euh, euh, américain. Et très clairement, très clairement, les Américains nous disent il faut que vous consentiez un effort militaire 
beaucoup plus important, que vous soyez beaucoup plus autonome, car c'est vrai que pour nous, nous allons et nous avons d'autres priorités. Donc ce n'est pas être contre l'OTAN, ce n'est pas contre les États-Unis avec lesquels fondamentalement nous avons les mêmes valeurs, quoi qu'on en dise, mais l'Europe, qu'on le veuille ou non, devra être la garante de sa sécurité avec le soutien des États-Unis. Et heureusement, d'ailleurs, puisqu'aujourd'hui, et le chef d'état-major français l'a dit, que s'il y avait aujourd'hui une guerre de haute intensité, l'armée française, qui est la plus puissante d'Europe, ne tiendrait pas plus de dix jours. Bon, donc le soutien américain, il est absolument essentiel. Mais quand moi je parle d'autonomie ou de responsabilité stratégique, j'ai en tête, et je pense que nous sommes certains à en voir en tête, une idée qui consiste à dire qu'il faut que nous apprenions à penser par nous-mêmes notre propre avenir, notre propre sécurité. Et pas contre les Américains, pas contre les États-Unis, mais penser par nous-mêmes, parce que personne ne pensera à nous-mêmes, à notre place. Et si on le fait, ce n'est pas pour la bonne cause. Bien, troisième point. Un, we, we have to wrap up, unfortunately. Yeah, 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 so, one, 60, one second. 60 seconds, uh, so we can wrap sur, up the session. Sur, sur le sud, euh, et là, je ne serai pas tout à fait d'accord avec ce que vient de dire Hubert, en ce sens que, et je peux vous donner des exemples de ce que l'on a vécu euh, depuis le début de la crise en Ukraine, avec l'Afrique, notamment, où il y a eu un formidable travail de désinformation russe, mais inimaginable, destiné à rendre l'Europe responsable de la crise alimentaire. Bon, qu'est-ce que nous avons fait Le représentant, il a envoyé une lettre à, aux 52 ministres africains des affaires étrangères, dans laquelle il leur a expliqué que les céréales n'étaient absolument pas couvertes par les sanctions, et il leur a dit « si vous avez des problèmes, notamment de « overcompliance » qui se pose, adressez-vous à nous, nous avons ouvert une ligne, euh, une hotline, et euh, nous avons euh, réglé un certain nombre de problèmes. Mais on ne peut pas accepter yeah. l'idée qu'un qu qu ministre, je ne serai right. pas africain, dise yeah. à, à Borrell, euh, ce sont les sanctions qui sont responsables de la crise, no. et quand on lui a dit qui est responsable, okay. qui vous a dit ça, il nous dit c'est Poutine. Voilà. Thank you so much. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, the future of Europe and European security after Ukraine, uh, I think I speak for all when I say this is a subject matter. We could s sit here until 8 p.m. and probably still not have covered all aspects, but I think you would agree that this, this uh, panel, in, in a very splendid manner, managed uh, to give us a very content-rich debate, so which I'm sure will also uh, be used for the discussion with uh, Foreign Minister Kuleba later on throughout the day. And uh, the 8 a.m. session on any given day, Song Nim, is never an easy task. So just for that, please join me in thanking this wonderful panel. Thank you so much.